People are going to have to tell me if it's happening. Are you out there? <laughs> Is there you anybody hear out us? there? Are we alone? So thanks on the recommendation for uh, We Are Legion, We Are Bob. Isn't it awesome? <clears throat> you are exactly right. It's as if somebody made me a science fiction book uh, that exactly explains my thinking on sort of exponential manufacturing capabilities and the best ways to, you know, von Neumann probes. And yeah, yeah, I'm really, really and enjoying it. And it puts the human brain in a computer, which I know you're kind of a fan of. Uh, well, it, just not I, the way they did it. Uh, no, no, I thought though I thought that was great, right? Which is like like they still want to have like a personality, a human personality that that runs the com the computer. So I I liked it a lot. And then it, but he could also sort of mess with it so he could like increase his frame rate and decrease his frame rate and create virtual worlds so he wouldn't go crazy. Yeah, I thought it was really neat. Um, I'm going to say hi to some people. Hello to Arnold Post, Astro B. Brooke Mulgata, Capital H, Catalin Bontia, Daniel McCool, Dane Coview, Dusty Reichwin, Ed Thompson, Ilad Avron, Eric Mackey, uh, Francisco Athens, Galaxia, Giselle Sabarin, Guido Bibra, Holly Meyer, John Suffield, Lakshy Deep, the Celestial Guy, Larry Beckham, Mac, Mac Sixblade, Michael Collins, Nancy Graziano, Neil Ferguson, Mel Ruppenthal, Arin Stroh, Rick Schwartz, Steve Heistend, Susie Murph, Thomas Traniker, Tom Van Scotter, and Yamag Yamagishi San. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, special live episode of Astronomy Cast. This isn't special. This is a normal this is a live normal, episode. Yeah, it's a normal first episode of the season. Doesn't that make it special that it's our first live episode of the season? Yeah, I'll give you that one. Yeah. Uh, the other book that I read that everybody was uh Cuvio. Uh everybody uh gave me a hard time to read was three body problem and so i read that have you read that yet yes it's people said that it was sort of like my favorite that it was their favorite explanation for the fermi paradox but i i'm not seeing it so maybe it's goes in further but uh i my, really my favorite... enjoyed it but my favorite explanation for the Fermi paradox is calculating God, uh, where it gets into the idea that uh, people either put themselves into computers or are killed off by the people who put themselves into computers and don't want to be destroyed. Right. Pick it, one. That the it's fiction, calculating God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I'll I'll dig into that one next. Um. Awesome. Let's. So what else is man? So much happened. So for those of you who, um weren't there i mean it's great to see a bunch of the names and actually now be able to put faces to the names we had a fantastic time at the eclipse uh some of us saw the eclipse some of us didn't i think the more accurate way of putting it is everyone on the astronomy cast trip except for me mm -hmm. saw corona and i saw cloud and, and I told you this was going to happen. I told you mm -hmm. all weekend this was going to happen. I did not know I was a prophet, however. Yes. Yeah, you, you are the sacrifice that we make so that we can see the eclipse. And so you need to go over there. And so I did. So we can see the eclipse over here. And yeah. I did. Yeah. I, I'm at nine minutes of cloud during totality. Mm. I'm amazed that you didn't see those. So for those of us who were there, you know, the skies were beautiful and clear. And then by sort of uh, the last, say, 20 minutes before the eclipse, this gigantic cloud rolled in and just set up right in front of the uh, in front of the sun. And so we missed the start of totality. And then we were down to like just a couple of maybe 30 seconds towards the end. And you could hear this cheer on one area at where we were in Carbondale. And then you could hear this cheer in, in the stadium area. And then where we were, we saw the clouds open up and there we saw the Corona and we saw the, um, we saw the sort of the into the Bailey's beads and the diamond ring and, and then it was over. And then the sun, that big cloud just vaporized and it was just hot for the rest of the afternoon while we waited yes. for the bus. Yes. So, so where I was, we could see people cheering while this little peninsula of asshole cloud 
was directly over us. And I don't care that the show is normally PG. That's what that cloud was. Stayed directly over me and Jim Cantore's head. And the two of us stood there in our cloud gathering capabilities, suffering on TV with people yelling in our ears, your mic is hot. <laughs> right, there's only so much swearing you're allowed to do on the Weather Channel. Well, we didn't do any swearing, but there was a whole lot of trying to figure out how to fill cloudy air. It wasn't dead air. It was just cloudy air. Just crying. That came later. <laughs> oh, um, uh, Lakshy Deep's wondering when the next solar eclipse is going to be happening. 2019 in... Chile, La Serena. I'm not going because everyone would hate my guts. <laughs> 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 okay, now I think you've taken your superstition a little far, Pamela. Um, no, it, it's it's just funny because people have been like, oh, you've got to come with us to La Serena. And then they think about it and they're like, wait, no, no really? Not you. No, no, yeah. not you. So I've had within a period of five minutes the same person, and it's been multiple people do this, both offer to take me and then rescind the offer. Yes. I think that uh, Paul is going down. Paul Matt Sutter is going to be going down in january to do sort of an exploration and try and sort of assess it out and we're tentatively going to try and do one in july for the for the eclipse i mean it goes right over the it goes right over the big observatories in chile like it sounds like the the perfect place so yeah uh <clears throat> Astro B just noted the sympathy with the people in the Caribbean and the southern U.S. No kidding. Yeah. What a nightmare. Well, it's, it's hurricane. And we have a global audience. And let's acknowledge that the whole planet's kind of broken right now. Yeah. There is significant flooding in uh, Southeast Asia with the monsoons this year where there have been a large number of deaths. So far, we've been very lucky with the hurricanes that while there's been complete destruction of several uh islands in in the Caribbean uh the loss of life has been minimal both from Harvey and Irma so far yeah. and the monsoons have not been so kind there was the massive earthquake in Mexico last night and while again loss of life has been minimal the amount of property lost to the forest fires that are eating the American, the North American yeah. Western part of the continent, both Canada and mm -hmm. the United States. We had 1,100 forest fires in British Columbia this summer. Like it, it's a, almost been a constant state of smoky air for months now. So it's been, uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a bit of a disaster. Yeah, the most beautiful sunsets I've ever seen, <laughs> yeah. but. We, we had this pink sun that you could look at with your unaided eye you could see sunspots but you shouldn't we should you shouldn't and we didn't but we did and we could see sunspots on the sun just right there it was like just just above the horizon and it was this pink color it was yeah, it's the craziest thing i've i've never seen the sun that sort of partly obscured and then the sun has gone a little kooky. We've had uh, these enormous flares. And so my phone, I have this, this Aurora alert. In fact, it just went off. I have this Aurora alert on my phone, and it freaked out that, that there was a – we had an 8.67 on the KP scale last night. The more, most I've ever seen with my app is like 5. And so it was just – it was off the charts. And, of course, clouds, right? First cloudy yeah. day, and but then the smoke would have made it suck anyway. So, but yeah, I got I got to show people what this looks like. Yeah, look at this. So here's my app. So the the yellow and the red, that's the that's the solar storms. Just and you can see right now it's seven point six seven. So so that is huge auroras going on right now. Yeah, earth, wind, fire, all of it, air, all of it. We're <laughs> under attack. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, so let's uh, let's start up this thing we call Astronomy Cast. I I hope I remember okay. how to how to do this. <laughs> all right. I right now I think you just press record and I we're good. I think that's what I do. I'm going to press record. 
Ah, I got an error. Hold on. Testing, Please check testing. recording yep. device. I'm recording. I am not. I have to restart Audacity. Audacity decided I do not actually have a recording device. <sighs> Silly little Audacity. I will stop my recording. <laughs> And I see someone asking, where's Eddie? He's directly behind me, threatening to eat something that crinkles. Yeah, there he is. Come here. Come on up, Eddie. Come on. Up. That dog is intense. I have never met <laughs> a more intense dog. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> that? What do you mean? What do you mean? Like, you don't understand that your dog is intense, that your dog is is always up to mischief is is yeah that's an intense dog he's a herding dog yeah he i know needs he, sheep he needs a job and and my job later today is going to be putting a a dog safety mount on my bicycle so we can go long distances together and chase deer yeah tire that dog out. and bunnies yeah. and other things yeah okay so in theory, I can now record. Okay, I'm ready uh, So too. shall we try again? Okay. I apologize I'm to everyone. Record. The smoke has just been all up in my lungs. So, okay. I'm recording. I am also recording? recording. Okay. Hi, Chad. Hello. We missed you, Chad. Hello, Chad. Um, Astronomy Cast, episode 456, Pluto Revisited. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand... Not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of University Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, the Director of Technology and Citizen Science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how's it going? It's going well. How's it going with you, Fraser? Good. This is the first time we've seen each other virtually since seeing each other in reality in St. Louis. And and that was kind of awesome, with the exception of I did not see Corona, but you got to see it, yes. and and <clears throat> everyone else got to see it, so I I took one for the team. So for those of you who have forgotten, we had a big live event in St. Louis. One hundred and thirty-five of our closest friends joined us live concert. We got a chance to go down and watch the eclipse live in Carbondale. All of us saw it except for Pamela who the, there was a big cloud obscuring it and she a little cloud yeah took the took that bullet so the rest of us could see it but uh and so thanks pamela and so i think w now we're hoping to maybe do some other kind of event maybe once a year so stay tuned as we figure out what what comes in the future uh this week we return to our starting point where astronomy cast began pluto 11 years on we have a whole new appreciation for the dwarf planet. We visited it, probed it, taken its pictures. It's time for an update. Let's let's just roll back the old astronomy cast memory, Pamela. Eleven years ago, our first episode of Astronomy Cast. What did we talk about? We talked about how just a few days previously, well, several days previously, at the International Astronomical Union meeting in Poland, there had been a vote that redefined what a planet is such that you can't have planets outside of our solar system. So it really does need to be reworked. And in the process of redefining planet, well, Pluto lost, Pluto lost its planethood. And of course, uh everybody was uh you know dealt with it well and they've long forgotten about it now no. 11 years later <laughs> nope this this is one of those things where i my husband was able to go out and he bought me a cute little solar system ruler for reasons i have no idea he thought it was cute and it had pluto on it i mean you can still go out and get things that list all the planets and pluto is listed among the planets and, and all of the other wannabe planets are left off because there is planet bias. I, I for one, celebrate Ceres, the, the first extra planet that has since been forgotten that it used to be a planet. So Yeah, I still get worlds. yelled at whenever I mention that, that it's a dwarf planet and not a planet anymore. Uh, and, of course, my argument to people is we've got Eris, 
which is roughly the same size as Pluto, mm -hmm. and it goes around the sun. So does it yes. get to be a planet? If not, and Ceres, sure, we have sure. Ceres. But if not, why not? Right. So so that means that you have ten planets. Like you're never going back to nine. You, you now you've got ten. You had Eris. Well, what about as you say, Ceres? You know, it's roughly in the same scale too. So it's eleven planets. What about Haumea and Makemake and all these other ones? 10 12 like how many planets do you want is it are you okay with 13 15 so so but you can't have nine and well you can just not with pluto and and this is where we're at is the the analogy that i use is if you were some very very organizationally motivated aliens who were in the process of gathering up materials to redo your own solar system and you came to our solar system with giant Tupperware containers, you would start by throwing all the gassy worlds into one container by kind. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, all in a bin. There you go. Then you'd probably go and grab all the rocky worlds and throw them in a bin. And here things will probably get a little bit messy because you either just grab the things going around the sun. So you have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. But do you grab the moon? Do you grab some of the moons? Here it gets a little bit messy, but because you have moons in the mix, the mess probably gets settled out where Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars get thrown in a bin. And then you grab all the other spherical balls of worlds, whether they be moons or asteroids or Kuiper Belt objects, and you throw all of them in a bin. Then you stick all the stuff that's going to melt in a different bin and you put it off to the side so that when it makes a mess, it doesn't make a mess where you worry about it. And then you throw all the asteroids and everything else in another bin. So in that schema of cleaning the solar system, Pluto is in a bin with a bunch of moons and a bunch of non-planets. I'm... I'm fine with it not being a planet, but I'm also fine with anything like Alan Stern made this proposal that anything spherical is a planet. I'm fine with that too. I, I, I don't care, I guess is the thing. I don't really mind. I, the definite, because they're, because <clears throat> I guess because I really feel like, like the solar system has changed so much that we've discovered so many new things. We're discovering all these new objects that, it is just in flux all the time. The change is our only companion. Don't panic. Everything's going to change again. Just, just embrace it. But, but, but Pluto is amazing. And we have seen some wonderful things at Pluto thanks to the New Horizons spacecraft. So let's less talk about how sad everybody is that it's been deplaneted. And let's talk about how wonderful a world it is and, and what we discovered. And it's it's a world that is finally getting names so that we can talk about all these amazing things we've we've found using actual names. So so first of all, Pluto has heart. And this is one of those things that I, I think as New Horizons got closer and closer to this little icy world, uh, we were all captivated by because it became visible fairly early on. We have named officially with the International Astronomical Union, this uh, heart-shaped, pale, nitrogen ice plane, uh, Sputnik Planitia. And this is one of the more awesome features because it was so unexpected. We were really expecting that Pluto would be this beat up, icy, cratered thing. And instead, we found this beautiful, smooth heart just staring at us from the equator. I love, I, I put the uh, the image up for the people who are watching the live show, and I really love the, the, the shape of this. This was unexpected to see yes. these kinds of structures on the surface of Pluto, right? They were expecting ices, but they weren't expecting the way. So, so you know, what exactly are we, you know, when we're looking at the heart, and the surrounding area, what are we looking at? We're still trying to figure that out. Uh, I, I so, thought we knew some stuff. <laughs> well, we know some stuff. I mean, the amount of stuff that we've learned since our first show in 2006, heck, we've changed the number of moons that we know that Pluto has. But when it comes to looking at these surface features, what we know right now, or at least what we think we know right now, is that Sputnik 
Planitia, I really can't say this, uh, is, is a icy nitrogen sea that has near it floating mountains of regular water ice and around it there is this weird dark material that when you look at it just right it looks like a whale and this whale of dark material we think is probably some sort of organic material that may have gotten left behind when there was some sort of an amazing collision between Chiron and Pluto at some point in the past. That's kind of amazing that they might have have interacted with one another, crashed into each other. It's 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 one of these really hard to model situations. So when we look at Pluto and Chiron and all the rest of the moons, and we do need to to note when we first did this show, Pluto was kind of hanging out by itself with Chiron. Um, which did you realize that Sharon was discovered in our lifetime? Because mm -hmm. I did not. Okay, 1979. It it was found in 78, but I oh. but like given acknowledgement in 79, mm -hmm. and then finally named in 85. But then its other moons were like discovered since we started this show. So Cerberus was discovered in 2011. Styx was discovered in 2012. Nix and Hydra, well, okay, they were discovered in 2005, but we're still learning about this system. And so all these moons were found and they're all in resonance. So when you look at how long it takes them to go around Pluto, you have between Chiron and Styx and Nix and Cerberus and Hydra, this amazing set of two to four to five to six resonances of their period once you start taking into account some of the precession that's in the system. So everything is locked in place. It means it's been there for, for long enough that all of these resonances could settle in. And when you run the models to try and figure out what kind of energies could be involved, one of the first models that was run assumed that Sharon must have formed much like Earth's moon, where many billion years ago, something came along, hit Pluto hard, because splash, now you have the Sharon system and Pluto together. But the energies don't work out. The, the orbits are too close, the mass is too similar, Everything is too settled in for that to have been the case. Another model, which seems to be working better, and we're still figuring this stuff out, another model that seems to be working better, better has Chiron and Pluto forming near one another and then colliding into one another, sharing some material back and forth, splashing things up, partially melting, forming organics on their surfaces, creating this dark whale on Pluto and the dark mortar, which is not the official name on Chiron. And it was a collision that partially melted things that may have slowed them down and locked them together gravitationally. And so I think the news that you're sort of meandering around is that the International Astronomical Union uh, what yesterday? <laughs> yes. Officially accepted the 14, 14 surface feature names on Pluto. And a lot of these names had been sort of in use already, but got sort of official acceptance. And, and many of the other names that we're using still aren't official. So the whale shaped dark feature on Pluto is. Uh, well, it, Cthulhu is part of its name, and that is not yet official. Should be. It should be, and it fits the naming schema. What's kind of awesome is the naming schema they, they have landed on celebrates both explorers where you have uh, various features that are named after the first people to uh, defeat Everest, and you have Tom Ba Riggio for the discovery of Pluto, Pluto Sputnik Planitia to celebrate the first spacecraft to orbit the Earth. Uh, but, but then you also have features that celebrate the first nations of Australia with, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this, Jengawol uh, Fossey, which, which is one of the regional gods for 
the Aborigines. Uh, so we have all of these different things that are getting recognized and celebrated. And by including the underworld, there is the potential that maybe, maybe, I, I, I don't know what kind of odds to place on this. Maybe Cthulhu can actually become part of an actual map of Pluto someday. That would be that would be awesome. So uh, yeah, you can see this this announcement out there on the on the interwebs and both do a search for the informal names because there's some great names in there. But as you said, right, you've got uh, Hillary Montes, you've got Tenzing Montes, those are the people that first went up Everest, you've got uh, Virgil, Elliot, Bernie, <laughs> I'm not sure what that's from, Tartarus, Dorsa. <laughs> Uh, so there's a bunch of really interesting names, and of course the big the big wide area is the spot the planitia. So, and the fact that these features are named, but I think one of the things that was just so amazing was that how Pluto looked kind of like Earth in that you've got uh, different kinds of features made of different kinds of substances, but here we've got oceans made of water and mountains made of of dirt of rock and on pluto you've got oceans frozen oceans made of hydrocarbons and mountains made of ice and and we can't totally explain all of this yet which i just this is why we do science we do science because we don't know all the answers and we want to and we just need the funding to send all the spacecraft out to see all the different things and with Pluto going into this, we thought this was a dead, boring world with a little bit of atmosphere and we expected a whole lot of craters and we expected it to be solid all the way through and we now think we were completely wrong. We're, we're finding this uh, nitrogen rich atmosphere that the sun shines blue through. Mm -hmm. We're finding that there's probably a liquid water or other liquid ocean that may be as much as a hundred kilometers deep. Our, our ideas were wrong and this excites us to no end because being wrong for lack of data means, well, we just guessed wrong and it's okay to guess wrong now and then. And the actual universe just keeps being far more exciting than anything our silly human brains could imagine without enough data. Uh, we, I, was it earlier this year, actually, Alan Stern has started to sort of shake the uh, trees and see to, and to get another mission to Pluto, maybe this time orbiter or even lander, which would just be amazing to be able to get back to Pluto and this time land, study the surface from close. Can you imagine a rover zipping around the surface of Pluto and some of these features? I, I don't think you zip on ice. That just seems like a really terrible <laughs> thing to try. Crunching carefully and delicately up these I, ice mountains. Yeah, I, I want to send something that is essentially covered in suction cups. <laughs> I, I don't know how else to send something to an icy world that has mountains the same size as the American Rockies on a world that is so much tinier. Just think of the scale heights on this. And it it's it's smooth ice. This is fresh ice. We see what appears to be convective cells from the ice continuing to be on the move, continuing to change. And I'm just a little bit excited about how awesome this little world is. And I have to admit my favorite part of all of the discoveries that New Horizons made is actually utterly ridiculous. And my favorite discovery is the surface of Pluto is younger than the amount of time that we have had honeybees evolved on the planet Earth. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I mean, the thing that's quite funny is like the, the data from New Horizons only recently finally arrived back on Earth. It took the better part of two years to slowly make its way back at this really slow bitrate communication. And so now I know that you were at the last uh, planetary meeting in Texas 
and they had made a bunch of announcements. And, and so they're still kind of trickling out the announcements of the things that they're finding on Pluto. So what are some of the other things that they've discovered on Pluto recently? Oh, man, where to start? Well, first of all, the atmosphere that it has has a variety of different layers to it. And it actually is set up in such a way we refer to the scientifically as inversion layers, such that the atmosphere away from the surface is warmer than the surface. And that's just kind of cool and weird and awesome. There are areas that are ancient that are covered in craters. So the question then becomes, how is it that you end up with this region over here that clearly isn't getting resurfaced while you have these areas over here that clearly have been completely flooded in and have different materials and trying to decouple all these processes is something we're still trying to figure out how to do and the different ways that they're approaching this is they're trying to build computer models where either it gets hit collision, whether it be some other object or Chiron, where the north-south poles are, change such that the axis of rotation today is radically different compared to the surface from what it was in the past. And we're still at the stage of throwing stuff into computer models and seeing which model comes out matching reality the best. We haven't even had enough time for a dissertation student to complete a dissertation working on this data. So I, I think it's going to be two or three sets of division of planetary science and lunar and planetary science and European planetary science meetings where everyone gets, everyone gets together, compares their models, competes for publications, moves on, reiterates. It's, it's going to be a few cycles of this before we start to say with certainty that whale of a formation, whether it be called Cthulhu Riggio or not, is covered in organics that are fresh versus are old. It's going to take us a while to figure these things out. And you mentioned the moons that that we already knew about, thanks to Hubble and and previous observations. And one of the big surprises is that there weren't any other moons discovered, like they've all been found. And that was unexpected. That, that was completely unexpected. It, it was a serious concern from 2012 forward that as they got closer and closer to Pluto, they might begin to resolve some sort of a dust ring, some sort of a debris ring. The worry was that with five moons, why wouldn't there be more? Why mm -hmm. couldn't there Little be ones more? Little ones that we, you know, the kind Spacecraft of things Spacecraft that... destroying ones. Yeah. Yeah, they were pretty concerned just about the path that they had to take through the system. They were ready to make changes to to New Horizons trajectory to avoid moons if they if it started to discover them as it got closer. And it just worked out that we were able to find all of them with Hubble and other ground based data well ahead of time. And uh, we don't have good data on all of them yet. Little Sticks was way too far away from the spacecraft and way too tiny to get good data. But we're now starting to realize, well, Hydra is a lumpy puzzle piece. And amusingly enough, Kerberos looks like a dog bone and Nix is your standard potato. Uh, Sticks, we don't know. It's a blob a few pixels across. But hey, it's more than just a dot of light now. And so we're starting to put together our solar system. We're starting to realize based on how shiny these things are that they're probably water ice in a large part. And well, the more you know, the better the models, the better you understand, and the more excited we are to science. So science. Well, the thinking right now I know is that the age of these moons are all the same. That yes. you know, they've done a bunch of crater counting and determined that all of the craters are, are we're all sort of, you know, that allows you to figure out the age of the object and that these moons are roughly all formed together in some just gigantic collision that happened a long time ago. And, and getting everything to be in these nice near resonances that they're currently in uh, with their 
exactly 18 to 22 to 33, which kind of rounds down to three to four to five to six when you get all of the moons engaged. To get everything in resonance takes time. Things may not start there and they get gravitationally put there. And so this is kind of cool. Now, another interesting thing that we're looking at is unlike some of Jupiter's moons that are in resonances and tidally locked, this system isn't tidally locked. So we were able to get different views, different sides, catch the rotations, get hints at the three-dimensional shape of these little moons. It's it's only hints because, again, only a few pixels across. And our our spacecraft, New Horizons, flew through way too quickly. But it uh, it's data we didn't have. Were there, I guess, you know, were there questions that you think the scientists wanted to get to the bottom of that they weren't able to find them? I guess, you know, we know about the lack of moons, but were there were other things that people were hoping to see or hoping to find that they didn't find? I think the entire, oh, wow, Pluto smooth. Huh, that's new. I, I, that was pretty much the initial uh, set of happy expletives that came out of most of our mouths because when you are expecting something to be completely cratered and you have your crater counters on board to spit out quick estimates of ages of the surfaces and you initially don't see any craters it kind of completely changes your plan of attack so it's no longer we didn't get the data we were hoping for to study this thing we were planning to study it's the that thing we were planning to study yeah that wasn't actually a thing <laughs> right like like as you said you know the that gigantic area is the largest um glacier in the solar system yes you, so you were yes. nobody was anticipating to find the biggest glacier in the solar system on pluto once they did, then then that was then they had to get to work to figure this out. And suddenly we're now talking about hydrodynamics instead of solid body physics and and everything gets much more different. And what was, I think, also re remarkable to a lot of us was just how different Pluto and Sharon are, because Sharon is this completely bit up, beat up world. It has these amazing cracks and valleys that kind of make Mars look smooth. And that's hard to do. And the discoloration, the difference in color between these two worlds, it's truly remarkable where they both do have these dark organic-y, we think, looking patches, but then all of Sharon is per pretty dark. And it's just wrapped in all different directions with these massive, well, these massive features that just wrap around as fault lines and show us how the surfaces cracked and collapsed over the ages. And now, of course, New Horizons is still going. Uh, it's going to be reaching its next target in 2019, I think. And they're, they're thinking that one of their future targets, if they're fully approved, even beyond that one, uh, they will get closer to it than to anything else they've been and will get even higher resolution images, which is kind of awesome. So the object is called... Um, they all have license plate numbers. Yeah, yeah. 2014 MU69 is the next object. And, they're, and, and right, that it's going to get three times closer to this than it did to Pluto and any image it. Because now, I mean, it's it's completed its main part of its mission. It can get really close. It can take some risks. It, exactly. Science. And, uh, yeah. So we we also have are, is MU sixty nine a different number for the same thing you just said? Um, because New Year's Day twenty nineteen. Uh, New Horizons is visiting MU69, but uh, many things have multiple license plates. Yeah, no, 20, 2014 MU, that's, 2014 is when it was discovered. Okay, yes. Yeah, sorry. That's its, that's uh, its license plate. And, and so it's, it's going to be able to see features that are simply tens of meters across, and that's kind of awesome. 
so I guess, you know, you know, we've got an update on what's happening with Pluto. Now we're going to wait for some more science to come out, some more planetary meetings for more discoveries to be made in all of this new horizon science. And then we need to have the, that next mission. We need to have that lander, that rover, or the ice skater. We, we need, I, I want suction cups. I want to be able to climb up those mountains in low gravity without accidentally like bouncing into outer space. All right. Well, we should, we'll pass along your suggestions to <laughs> Dr. Stern. I'm sure he's, he'll, he can't wait to incorporate suction yeah, cups. No yeah. No climbers. one is, no one is building that. I, I want it. No <laughs> one is building that. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's amazing how science has changed in the years we've been doing this and here's to hoping that in another 10 years we're coming back and uh there's another spacecraft that is nearing pluto once again awesome i can't wait thanks pamela my pleasure what do we do now? and now we save right that's right that's what we do now i remember <laughs> welcome to the boring part of the show save project as what episode number are we on that was 256 okay no not 256 456 oh sorry yeah 456 and then i will export the wave Upload it. Then we are done. Yes. And then we'll stick around and answer some questions. Yes. Hmm. I don't see the astronomy cast directory. Oh wait, maybe there. We filled yeah, it. Yeah, it's there. It's filled with BarkBox ads currently. I see the. We love BarkBox. Eclipse Escape, but. I yeah, that's the same folder. Oh, is it? It got changed yeah. to, okay. It, it should just say Astronomy Cast is the folder title. No, it's in shared. It. Oh, weird. But you see. I see the AC see Eclipse, Eclipse Escape. Yeah, it's that folder. Oh. Okay. Just stick it right in there. Okay. All right. I'll, I will upload it to that location. Yeah, there should be AC Eclipse Random, AC Eclipse Ep A, AC Eclipse Ep B should be the top three files in it. Well, there's a oak. No, I, I'm not seeing that directory. I wonder if that I is dropped confusing. it somehow. Okay, we can work this one out later. Yeah. No problem. No problem. <laughs> we just made the boring part of the episode more boring than normal. Boring. Okay. Uh, let's answer questions from the audience. Yay. Gordon recommends an ice Fine. sailboat. Now that would be cool. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like an ice sailboat? I love it. If you get going too fast, you're going to launch yourself into orbit. Yeah. That makes it fun. Um <clears throat> Uh, Astro B, will this come every Friday evening? Yes. Well, no, it's going to be an hour earlier. So we had to record today an hour earlier than we normally, an hour later than we today normally Today was an do. hour later. Yeah. yeah. So from here on out, we're going to be recording at 12 p.m. Pacific time. So we're rearranging things and uh, we're going to be moving the Patreon office hours around again, still doing them both Fridays and uh, Sundays in different weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, we totally forgot to plug our Patreon. We should do that next week. Okay. Um, and then the weekly space hangout is moving to Wednesdays at 5 PM Pacific time. And that's because, uh, uh, Morgan and Kimberly, who are now coming on as regular co-hosts, have day jobs, and so they can't they can't record during the day anymore. But they'll be able to record in in the evening. So that's when we're doing it. And and those of us who keep getting telecons on Fridays will also be able to participate more. Uh, okay, so go ahead. If you got any questions, uh, 
Ren NC Brazil, does NASA have any planned proposals for building relay stations around the solar system for better communication with exploration probes? And I guess that sort of comes up with the the difficulty of communicating with the Voyagers and even the difficulty of communicating with New Horizons. So we currently actually are using Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter as a telecommunications relay with the rovers on the surface. So this isn't a new idea and we do it whenever we can. Uh, currently, I don't think we have any plans to, uh, I, let me rephrase that. I don't think there's anything actively funded for construction. That doesn't mean there aren't white papers and things like that that are being worked on. Yes. It, I mean, space is big. And so, and everything's moving, everything is orbiting. And so then if you're, if you want to have a relay station, like you definitely, a relay station would allow you to to communicate at a much higher bandwidth, still at the speed of light, yeah. but it actually would take even longer because now you have to take a, a longer journey to bring your communications back to Earth. The the downside is that you have to put a whole pile of these out there into into space. So I mean, it's just space infrastructure would be awesome, but there are no plans right now. It's it's the kind of thing that will get figured out, but funding is so scarce, you just have to. Focus your resources resources wherever you can. Um, right. I'm, don't say um. Arjun asks, what form of locomotion would be appropriate for a planet with a gravity as low as Pluto? So if you could fly to Pluto and walk around on the surface, how would you want to get around? Uh, man, I mean, you want to stick to the surface mm -hmm. as well as you can. And it's not metallic, so magnets aren't going to help you. So you really need something that, as you're going, will dig in. And failing that, this is where the whole idea of like suction cups is appealing, because that's a nice, simple thing to do, although not easy at low temperatures. So you can almost imagine that you're constantly stabbing yourself in with harpoons as you go but that requires a whole lot of energy. So there's really no easy way to go about this given constantly changing angles of a lot of the interesting parts of the surface, the low surface gravity and the slipperiness of ice. It's a 12th the strength of the earth gravity and that it's about half the strength of the moon's gravity. So I, you know, you could, get around the surface of Pluto the way the astronauts did, right? The way they sort of did these funny little hops. But as you said, because, well, but I mean, it's not warm enough. So the ice isn't even going to be that slippery, right? The ice is going to be, is going to feel pretty gritty under their, under their feet. So it's just a matter of having, I mean, I think crampons would be great, but it's, you know, when you think about the, them walking around the moon, it took some training, but it didn't. Uh, it wasn't like so they were going to fly what, off the surface like you would on a comet, right? What what has me concerned is we don't know if it would be gritty or not. It if you just flat out freeze something, uh, it's really really smooth and low friction. Now, admittedly, the reason that ice skaters and sledders and all of that are able to gain a lot of the awesome speed they gain is because you end up with melt between the blades and the ice. Yeah. Now, what I'm concerned about is you can go sledding on sand dunes, on icy hills, especially if, if they're like nice, smooth, shiny grass and not gravel underneath. And you could get going down one of these hills at a pretty good clip if you lost your footing, just like you could down sandstone or anything else. And I don't want to have a ski jump into orbit that accidentally occurs due to changing inclination angles. Right. But even, but, but I mean, with one twelfth earth gravity, you're not ski jumping into orbit. You right. underestimate my ability to be a klutz, and thus my concern. So, so imagine you've gone up one. It, no, seriously. Right, but so if you think could, this, that's you ski jumping thousands of kilometers per hour. But I, 
I don't think you have to go that fast to go into orbit. I now need to go do these calculations. But imagine like going down one of these alp, not alp, one of these uh, rocky mountain sized mountains with their super steep inclination angles and then hitting a smooth transition at the bottom, you could get yourself launched pretty damn good. Uh, the escape velocity on Pluto is is the same. It's a 12th. So in other words, you need to be going, you know, so for here, you need to be going eight kilometers, eight and a half kilometers per second. You need to be uh -huh. going, say, you know, just a little less than a kilometer per second. 1.2, sorry, 1.2 kilometers per second is the escape velocity of Pluto. So if you can ski jump at... 1.2 kilometers per second, and allow me to just convert that. KPH, 4,320 kilometers per hour. If you can reach that kind of speed. I now need to do the math for the next episode on this, and that makes me sad, but I'm adding it to my to-do list. Math. I just did it. Just did your math. You didn't do, you, you didn't do the potential energy to velocity that to kinetic energy transition from the top of one of those mountains to one of those bottoms of one of those mountains to see what kind of velocity gain is possible sure but you're going to have much lower gravity people are going to just be loving this now uh you got the, you've got lower gravity right so the the acceleration that you that you speed up is less and but you don't have the terminal velocities that you have here on earth because there's less gravity right i but, mean there's less atmosphere but aren't you also sort of i want to math it <laughs> let me math it fine math it math it up math it out i'm just saying that that it's fast but i understand what you're saying that you uh you know because there is no atmosphere. orbital velocity and i'm only talking about orbital velocity not escaping the whole gravitational pull. right Right, like on the Earth, I think orbital velocity is eight and a half kilometers per second, while escape velocity is 12 kilometers per second. And you have to get really high up because our atmosphere is a drag. Yeah, you don't have to go as high on Pluto as you do on Earth. True. But still, you can't go into orbit with a single maneuver. Right. You have to have a you have to have a second maneuver. Otherwise, you know, your orbit is going to intersect your starting point again. Well, that's still an orbit. It's just a very deadly one. Right. Fine. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, like, can Superman punch a person into space? Yes. But yes, they, have they just to come, won't stay there. Right. They have to come back down where they where they started. So um, unless they, you know, they have some sort of thruster on them at the top of that orbit. Man, did we go down a, a rabbit hole, and we've only scarcely begun. I can't wait to see Pamela doing the math. <laughs> I look forward to the uh, – maybe that's a homework assignment. Oh, I, I may do this on Twitch. Yeah. I may do this yeah. on Twitch to just amuse everyone at the same time. So stay tuned this weekend. Mm -hmm. Subscribe to Star Strider on Twitch. I may math silly things out loud. I'm going to see if I can get a, a – tablet working with my computer so you let you everyone said right uh, by hand 5.564 kilometers per second for pluto is the uh is that the escape velocity or is it the orbital velocity uh okay uh galaxia wants to know could a slingshot along pluto have been possible without loss of time to fill, fulfill all the scientific goals. They knew what their plans to admit mission to fly to a second object. So, so could they have done a slingshot maneuver around Pluto to then get a better angle, I guess, to go to another target? I, I'm not sure, given the velocity of Pluto that and our, at the time, knowledge of where there was other stuff to go visit. Um, if the gravity was enough, given the velocity of the spacecraft already, um, and given the dearth of targets we were aware of, if if anything could have been done. I just don't know, but there, it's a very complex problem because there just weren't that many targets to try and aim for. Yeah, I mean, I think that they had no expectation for what was going to happen after Pluto. That Pluto is the goal. And yeah. 
so you develop your spacecraft with the best possible chance of achieving your science goals and you're not concerned about what happens after that if your spacecraft does survive then you decide what you might want to do with it after that um yes i did an episode on the voyagers recently and there was sort of a heartbreaking irony with the with the voyager spacecraft which was that they you know voyager one did saturn and or did jupiter and saturn and the way they did the the trajectory of that they had it go past titan and so they had to sort of to be able to hit both saturn and titan they had to go in this very specific orbit and they had a choice they could have gone to titan or pluto and in the end they decided titan because titan was closer and more of a mystery it turns out titan's clouds obscured the view from voyager one and so they they lost their shot at pluto because they yeah. sent voyager one to titan in in retrospect they should have had to go to pluto i i'm not sure it's that clear because finding out that titan was completely covered in clouds that was kind of amazing and probably helped justify the galileo mission well yeah i mean cassini the 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 instruments that they put on to cassini to be able to see titan were You're right, specifically cassini, chosen yeah to be able to get through that that atmosphere it had that radar yeah. instrument to be able to see down but it still was just as i said you know sort of heartbreaking and and ironic that that's what happened one person's heartbreak is another person's favorite data i guess so and another note is that we are a week away from the end of Cassini. Yeah, I know. So that's going to happen. In That's a thing. Yeah. We we might, uh, David Joseph Wesley and, and I have a plan. So it might be that we're making a thing to celebrate Cassini. So I, I know about this thing. It's an exciting thing. Definitely stay tuned. Yep. Uh, Renan C. Brazil, any news about the impossible drive? No news. There's been no news about the impossible drive. It's probably impossible. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, apart from some people testing it and saying that they think it works, it still fundamentally breaks the laws of physics. We understand it. So that's, you know, that's the thing. So Noah Rubenthal asks, interesting engineering possibility, though. Could you launch a spacecraft directly into orbit by accelerating on a runway? No. No, because you'd still smack right back into the planet right. unless you did. Remember, it's an ellipse, and it's a repeating ellipse. And you have to add energy when you get above the surface or you come back down and complete that ellipse into the surface. Right. And, and this is where you really want to play some Kerbal Space Program. But yes. The, but the key is, is that, as, exactly as you said, that every, every, you know, you go up and you come back down. And it's, you can't get into an orbit unless you're able to make a change at the height of your, of your launch. So yeah. you need a second thrust when you get to Apogee to be able to yes. push yourself into an orbit. It's true. Well, we're at the end of our hour, so why don't we wrap things up? Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching this first rusty version of Astronomy Cast as we get ourselves back into habit of being able to produce these on a regular basis. Thanks, as always, to the WSH crew. If you want to join this community, uh, go to wshcrew.space, and you can then go there, and they've got instructions on how to join the community. And that's how you partake in the forum down here uh the w the weekly space hangout returns on the 13th at 5 p.m pacific standard time with four co-hosts me kimberly morgan and uh dr paul matt sutter well everyone's a doctor actually except for me so they're all dr morgan renberg dr kimberly cartier dr paul matt sutter and fraser so I, i'm there doctor doctor <laughs> doctor 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 fraser <laughs> That's how it's going to go, I think. <laughs> so that's what's up soon. Uh, as always, you should watch the uh, Guide to Space. We've got some great episodes up there right now. I'm really proud of them. And Pamela, you got anything else to shamelessly self-promote? 
Stay tuned. CosmoQuest has some really great things coming, hopefully next week. But I mean, as as always, uh, right now there are hurricanes kind of headed towards Kennedy, and Johnson is still pumping itself dry. So I I say this with a we're hoping next week, but stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. All right. See you later, everybody. Next week. Bye bye. <laughs>